Hey guys, Professor Bell, Comic Book University, and Venom, issue number three. We are putting an all-points bulletin out for Mr. Al Ewing. I don't know what happened to him. He was at issue one of this. There's the big hubaloo about, oh look, Donny Cates and Al Ewing. They're switching books. Let's see what they do with each other's stuff. And then Ram V was just kind of inserted in here, and we're like, well, if he's here, like, it must be for really good reason. And apparently the really good reason is... Al Ewing ain't coming back. Maybe he's coming back in the future. I don't know. I'm I'm not delving into the... I, I used to really get into, you know, looking into, oh, well, it looks like Al Ewing is going to come back for issue number 23. I I, I don't care. I don't care. You, you, you either explain it or you don't. And I'm not going to start hunting for this stuff. I'm not this chick in this comic book who's going to start putting articles up on a wall connecting them with red yarn. Like, come on. All right, I'm not a conspiracy theorist for crying out loud, uh, and I'm and I'm not a comic book investigator. So I, I I just want to read good comic books. Still looking for one. In this particular case, there was a lot of things done right, and there were unfortunately a few too many things done wrong. Let me start breaking all those things down first. Let's give credit for the good things where credit is due. Ram V is the writer. Brian Hitch is the penciler. Brian Hitch um, did the inks along with assists from Andrew Curry. Alex Sinclair did the color art and VCs Clayton Cowles doing letters and production. Nice. Guy's getting some promotions I'm digging on. I hope that means he's getting more money, too. <laughs> Not just a title, because nobody needs just titles. Um, Alex Sinclair and Brian Hitch both did the cover, and there's a one single variant cover. I like there's only one variant cover by John Boy Myers, so yay! Anthony Gambino on design. All right, so let me read you something, and this is off the same page that's just reading off of, so just stay there for a moment. Years ago, Eddie Brock was a reporter whose career was ruined, and he contemplated ending his own life, but he found a kindred spirit, an extraterrestrial uh, parasitic alien called a symbiote. The creature bonded to him, and the two were joined together. They are Venom. And this is Venom Escalation Part 1. Keep that in mind, this is the start of a new story arc. Issue 3, start of a new story arc. Hmm. Recently, the Wicked Web Slinger discovered that he had a son, Dylan. I like that, the Wicked Web Slinger. Um, of course, it's not actually Venom who has the kid. It's, it's, but we are anyway. Uh, now Eddie has become a god himself, the king in black and ruler of all symbiotes, and he's using his ability to protect the universe and guide symbiotes into a new era of peace. But after a bizarre and seemingly impossible series of events, Eddie Brock is dead, and Dylan only narrowly escapes after doing the one thing he promised his father he would never do, bonding and becoming Venom. Did he actually bond with the thing? Because I thought it was going to take longer than that. I, I didn't notice that he actually bonded with them. It was one of those things where they, like, they showed and didn't tell, but it turns out they actually did neither. They just drew some pictures and didn't bother writing anything. I didn't, I didn't get the idea that it, it's a shame when you when you read the ending of an issue two and an issue three's preamble or forward explains what you just read. This is one of the reasons why so many of us are confused when we're reading comic books because. They don't they make a much of sense. Anyway, was I supposed to sound like Watto in there or just some really weird Italian? Or were they trying to make fun of Italians <laughs> in the uh, the original, the first uh, Phantom Menace, whatever the hell that thing was called? All right. So we're starting off with the head of the Life Foundation or one of the board representatives or whatever. And, oh, look, here's this guy named Mr. Carson. Now, apparently the whole purpose of Mr. Uh, of the... The, this is the first third of the book, and the whole first third of the book is to give us an idea of what is going to be happening from this point going forward. That's interesting, because I thought that's what the first two issues were for, or I thought that was what the, the, the forward was meant to be in a book, right? To tell us what has happened to, what are we reading, right? Who is the main character, or what, what exactly is it that we're reading? What, is, what has happened recently, and a hint at what we're about to, to get. Like a little, little tease that makes us want to keep reading and bow, powerhouse, read right through this thing, stopping to enjoy the art along the way. The entire first third of the book is just this. It's all recap of the history of the Life Foundation, which could have been done in a another blurb in the forward 
tell me I'm wrong. Just tell me, tell me I'm completely crazy on this and, and, and fine. Then I understand where we're at with each other, right? Again, me saying that I didn't like a book is not me saying that you are not justified for liking a book. If you liked this book, that's great. I'm here to actually judge it as a comic book, as a work of literature, right? As some form of short story continuing nonfiction, right? Not nonfiction. This is not nonfiction. Fiction, all right? This is a short form novella, all right? With lots and lots of pictures. That's what this is. When I used to uh, edit comics for, for a small publishing agency, boom, there we go, right? This is, these are the standards by which I am judging this comic book. That's all. It is not to say that you have bad taste in liking or disliking anything. So moving forward, the whole thing is to introduce Mr. Carson, who is apparently some dullard who keeps things short and just gets things enough to move forward, right? Mr. Carson is this bald black guy uh, of no particular physical, you know, wow, nothing special about him. And he's apparently going to be the guy, as we see later on, uh, towards the end of the story, is going to be operating this machine, this suit of armor called Spearhead. Okay, cool. Uh, we can see that on the cover of the next issue. You know, they, they show it. There's a point where the, the, this, this head of the Life Foundation is just blah, 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 for an entire third of the book. Blah, 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 talking, talking, talking. You know, uh, um, all, she, all, all she's saying is, this is what the Life Foundation is. This is what we've always done. This is what a symbiote is. And then he turns around and looks pretty much directly at us, just slightly off camera and says, thus, the, the name symbiote. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Why not just add stupid at the end of it, right? Thank you for talking at us. They, and, and there's so many times when he turns around, he's talking, he's looking just off camera, which means that he's basically talking to us without actually breaking the fourth wall. So he's, he's narrating without actually being a narrator, taking the title of narrator. Okay, I see what you're doing here. But you wasted an entire third of the book. And all of it, all of it, was just to get off this very simple thing where he says, what is an umbrella? This guy goes, uh, I'm not sure I understand your point, Mr. Drake. <sighs> Tell me, Mr. Carson, what is an umbrella? Uh, something that keeps the rain off? So we're dealing with a very stupid person here. But he says, yes. You see how we design, uh, define things by their function? Sure. Sometimes I, I could look, uh, a computer computes. It computes all the process, but we don't call the computer nowadays. Like, like we don't have different names for computers necessarily, right? We have computer, laptop, uh, tablet, phone, right? But gamers don't call it a gaming device, Right. It may be your gaming platform, but you don't call it my gaming platform. Yeah, I'm going to go home and get my, my uh, I, I need a, a new mouse for my gaming platform. That, that's not what we do. Uh, let me show you something. Look. Ugh. Books. Books. We don't call this reads. We don't call these reads, right? We don't call them readers, right? I know, an e-reader. We don't call this by anything else except a book. We title things. So that was very cute, right? We define things by whatever. I get it. But at the same time, poking holes in an umbrella, which is the, the whole point of this here. I, like, it's like someone who is not a philosopher trying to get philosophical, right? How many holes do you have to poke in an umbrella for it to not be an umbrella anymore? You'd have to destroy it. Because even if you take a, a computer and you throw it off a 10th story building and it crashes and it shatters and there's just smithereens of this computer all over the ground, it's still a computer. 
You want to get philosoph uh, philosophical. Let's talk about this. Which part of you is you? If I cut off your arm and I throw it over there, away from you, would you say that I am over there? No, you'd say my arm is over there. Which part of you would I have to cut off and remove in order for you to say I am over there? Right? Which part of you is the you? Because it's obviously not all of you, because you could, again, cut off your arm. My arm is over there. Which part of you is the you? Ah, now we're talking actual philosophy. This, this is telling me that everybody in the first third of this book is a freaking idiot and so full of themselves and think that they're so, 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 therefore, if you're stupid, but you're the brains behind an outfit, I am not threatened by this organization. I'm simply not. Nobody is, is wagging the tail on this dog, right? <laughs> like when dogs wag their tails, they're just kind of, you, the only part of a dog you're worried about is its teeth. So is that what we're to understand here? Because here's this this childlike old man with white gray hair taking his cigar and burning holes in, in a picture of Venom's eyes. Wow, are you making a mask? None of this stuff is impressive. None of this stuff is threatening. None of this stuff means anything to me. So that's the first third of the book. A complete waste of time recapping things, and barely introducing two idiots. One who actually thinks he's smart, the other one who just kind of goes, uh, all the time, and clearly doesn't think that he's that bright. <laughs> right? And then we see this whole moth towards light thing that freaking Eddie is, or excuse me, that, that Venom is doing. Eddie, Venom is lost. He's all over the place. Here's another recap of this is what I used to be. So we're in the second third of the book. We're in the, the, the second act of this comic book right now. And we're in, we're already in another recap. Venom's recap this time. Did they, by this issue, did Ram V just realize that Al Ewing isn't coming back? Is that why we're doing this? Is that why we're in the situation that we're in right now? Because Ram is like, oh crap, I have to do this whole thing by myself? Okay, 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 I could do this, but I have to establish some parameters first. So this kind of has to be an introductory issue. Because when you think about making a new story arc, all right, it's a story arc because the story is continuing, there's just different arcs in it, right? It's still a continuous bunch of jumps, but the arc is just this particular jump, right? This particular short set of stories in this long form story, broken up into little pieces. I think the Green Mile was released like that, right? Stephen King? I, I think he wasn't calling himself Stephen King at the time. It was one of his alter egos. Anyway, the idea is that this is how you, you sometimes break up a long-form story. You, you put it out in chapters, right? Okay, that's fine. So this particular chapter in this life is escalation. This is part one of that. But we just had two issues of, of what? Back in the day, back in the day, I, I, I know there's some people who don't like the idea of this, but the people who created comic books, right? The people who more specifically created, because Walt Disney, for the most part, created comic books. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the, the, the people who created superhero comic books, DC, later on, uh, Timely, Atlas Marvel, right? Um, Fawcett, before that, uh, Fox Syndicate Comics, Charlton Comics, all these people way back in the day who actually began the superhero era and genre of comics. These were really smart people. I'm not saying that Ram V is not smart. That's not what I'm arguing here. And I, I'm pretty sure that his first language isn't English. If it is, my bad. All right? I've never talked with uh, Ram V before. Um, this sounds like a Middle Eastern name before. And I, and I know, being an English teacher, all right, being a goddamn good English teacher, I know how different countries will sometimes either slur a word or a sound. Case in point, my Italian heritage comes in a lot, and sometimes my T's sound like D's. It's just the way that it is. Um, what do you call it? L listen to the R's 
of Japanese people, for instance, just to get an idea. They're L's, right? It's, it's just one of those things. You can tell where someone is from when you understand linguistics enough that you can tell the mistakes that they make in the language that you mainly speak. All right. And I mainly speak English. My other languages are maximum fluency level three, right? Some of them are only level one, but it is what it is. My Arabic, for instance, is level three out of nine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's not that great, but it's, it's conversational if it's specific. In this particular case, Ram is taking on certain features of someone who's just realizing that something has changed, right? The language that is being used in here, the mistakes that are being made. At one point, at one point, there's a, there's a, a preposition that's wrong that, that got me confused in a single word bubble because I actually know the English language. I'm, you know, level 20 fluency in English language. He says, I wonder if I can find it. What does he do in here? Which, which, which realistically, I'm, I'm more about, here it is right here. I'm more interested in the editor screwing up on this. I found our best bet at digging deeper, a small research facility in Plymouth. Um, I've cased the place before. So right away, people who aren't great with English or who, who just don't care, they look at this and say, I found our best bet at digging deeper. Okay, cool. But that's the wrong preposition. At. No. Because when I read this, I found our best bet at digging deeper. And I'm thinking to myself, the red alarms are going off in my head saying, where's a place called digging deeper? Right? I, I This is where you'd say, I found our best bet at McDonald's. I found our best bet at the Chrysler building. I found our best bet at the movie theater. Right? At. Pointing to a location. Right? But no. Instead, it goes into an idiom. Digging deeper. <laughs> right? Because digging deeper in another language doesn't mean this. It literally means digging a hole. Here, it's um, analogous for, oh, look, I'm, I'm going to find out more about the case. No shovel required. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So in here, I found our best bet for digging deeper. Right? You see these little things here and there, and, and you just, it, and, and one, it tells me about the writer. It's also telling me about the total fallacy of the editor in this case. What, Devin is, is the guy in this? Every time I ask a current uh, editor, what is your job? They always tell me some superfluous stuff about what my job isn't, right? Are you supposed to put little asterisks telling me where I can read the thing that was just mentioned that will get me to, here's a, here's a funny marketing thing, buy more comic books someplace? And they say, no, no, that's not my job. Uh, it's, you know, if the writer wants to do that, cool. Or if the, the artist, or excuse me, if the editor feels like doing that, by all means. But we're not required. We're not expected to do stuff like that. You're not expected to sell more comic books. You have no, that's not your job, right? Well, when the comic books get lower and lower in sales and they're laying off more and more people, will you then realize hindsight? Everybody knows hindsight is twenty twenty, but through twenty twenty vision, hindsight, will you say, maybe I should have tried to sell more comics? Huh. Even if you're just going to try and sell more Venom comics or more comics that you yourself have been the editor on, I, I don't know. I don't care. It's one of those things where maybe, maybe you should care. When I, when I say, are they, are you guys supposed to be spell checking? Oh no, that's really the writer's job. And then when the writer turns around and says, no, that's the editor's job. Yeah, I'm supposed to do the best I can, but you know, I use Grammarly. Guys, I am kerfluffed at the point of Grammarly. All these different little apps and things that we use to, to keep ourselves. Look, I'm old. I'm old. I'm 46 years old. I was born in 1975. All right. My saved numbers, my contacts list in my phone, I didn't carry a phone when I was younger because phones weren't carryable when I was younger. They weren't portable, right? Um, if they were, there were these big box things that no kid wanted to wear and no, no kid could afford, you know? Um, and for crying out loud, I carried a black book if I needed to, if I had too many phone numbers to memorize, right? 
732-787-1797. That was my phone number when I was a kid, when I was five years old, living in Keensburg, New Jersey, <laughs> right? That was my phone number when I was a kid. If you're watching this and that's your phone number now, you'd be like, what, what, what? Yeah, that was my phone number when I was, when I was five years old. Technically, I was living there since I was four, but it was five when I remembered it. But like, that's the thing. And, and I've remembered a slew of phone numbers with all the different places that we moved to and whatnot, right? I, I remembered license plates numbers, all sorts of different things, right? And it's like, come on, man. There used to be a time when people actually knew how to write. I'm going to go right back just specifically to the 60s. When I was a kid, born in 1975, reading old comic books in my grandmother's basement with the covers torn off. Why? Because those were the original bootleg uh, covers back then. When you had comic books back then, where, here, this is a good one, right? When you had comic books back then, this, later on in the 80s, this meant, the, 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 the symbol here meant that you bought this from a comic book store. When you when it had a UPC on the front, that means you got it from the newsstands, which was in a drugstore or a grocery store or F all wherever it is that you bought it from. It wasn't from a comic book store. It wasn't from a direct retailer, right? Um, they didn't use, at comic book stores, they didn't use barcodes at the time. So they would just put like a Spider-Man symbol there instead. But they would still have that white space, you know, whited out. So that you could put a barcode if you wanted to, or to let you know, oh yeah, this is going to a direct retailer. This couldn't be returned. Back in the day, back in World War II, a little history lesson here, back in World War, no, not even World War II, the Great Depression, World War II got us out of this for the most part. The Great Depression, uh, the Dust Bowl happening in Oklahoma at the time, right? You, it was very hard to sell books. There were, there were engineers who were out on the street with a tin can and pencils, wooden pen, number two or whatever, pencils, selling pencils to people. Hey, five cents for a pencil. You need a pencil? Pencils, right? No different than, oh, I can't remember the name of the guy who was choked out by the cops. Uh, the I can't breathe guy. Why can't I remember his name? Anyway, too many of those in the news. I can't remember the name right now. Um... Way too many people. But anyway, the guy who said, you know, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, going out and buying a pack of cigarettes, thinking about, you know, doing the math and saying, oh, how much would each cigarette be if I paid this much for a pack of cigarettes? Let me instead turn this around and, and just raise the, I'll double the price or something like that and sell, you know, individual cigarettes like that. It's a perfectly acceptable business. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's how people survived during the Great Depression. Like people with degrees, they would survive that way, selling pencils on street corners for crying out loud. You know, it's, it's baffling to the mind that back in the day, you couldn't sell a book. Most people could not afford books. So what purpose was there for a bookseller to buy a book? Hey, if I buy a book from this publisher, I, you know, and it doesn't sell, then I'm sitting on inventory. Like, here's my, my money is in these books and I can't sell the books. So I can't actually make cash. I can't eat books. I can't trade books for food. What do I do? So the booksellers realize that the, the, the book publishers realize, Hey, we're, we're not selling any books. How about this guys? Here's the deal. Buy these books from us. And if they don't sell in a month, you can return them back to us. What I, I think it was, we'll pay the postage. Yes. Yes. It was, we'll pay the postage. They said, all right, fine. So they would start buying more books. Instead of buying one book, they would buy three books. They would buy five or ten books, you know what I'm saying, depending on what it was and what they thought would sell. So this is what kept the publishing houses in business back in the day. Cool. Pretty soon, now here's where it gets to the comic book parts. Pretty soon they start realizing, hey, man, it's getting expensive for them to mail the stuff back to us because magazines are considered books also. Um, the purpose for switching over from hardcover books to, um, paperback books was that we'll sell hardcover at first because the people who really want the stuff will get it. The people who just borrowed it from the library and they would like a copy, but they're not going to pay hardcover prices. What can we do for that? Oh, we'll make paperback books instead because paperback is so, so much cheaper than hardcover, right? That's the reason why softcover came out later and magazines, same thing, like, you know, whatever. 
but mailing back an entire so 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 hardcovers usually never came back. Paperbacks, that's when it came to second the second edition of a book would be in paperback, usually. Sometimes they do a second edition of hardcover, but that's neither here nor there. The second edition would come out in paperback. And all forthcoming, therefore. So if those didn't sell, okay, we'll send them back. So this way it's not as heavy as the hardcover. But that started getting expensive too. So the publishers said we gotta we gotta find ways to cut costs. Okay, listen, here's the deal. It's on the front cover that you'll have the UPC. All right, and I've got to have a comic book here. I, I know I've got a comic book here that's got a, uh, I got too much stuff on top of there. Here we go. Here we go. Look at this. Right, the UPC. So send me the part of the book or the magazine that has the UPC on it. All right, send me that part. And then, you know, just send me that. And then on your word, you have to destroy the book itself. You save me the cover or the, you know, the whatever, the front cover, back cover, whatever that has the UPC. And then the rest, you you burn that, you destroy it, okay? Not just throw in the trash rip, you actually destroy that part. Can we agree on that? This is a, a word of honor, you know, deal. This way you don't have to pack the whole book. You can just put a couple of covers in, the same thing for magazines, just rip off the cover and boom, boom, boom. And the exact same thing with comic books also, right? So just instead of sending back the whole entire comic book, so if you've got 50 comic books that didn't sell, instead of me paying the shipping for the weight of 50 comic books, I could just do 50 covers, which is the equivalent of what? Two and a half comic books. Suddenly the weight difference is greatly changed and they're not paying so much for shipping because that's not just from one or two stores. That's from all the stores around the nation. And if you sold to Canada also, there was a time where Canada banned American comic books in the 70s, but whatever, all right? Actually, 60s into 70s, all right? But... Getting into the history of this stuff, that's the reason why um, for comic book stores, they didn't have this part because <gasps> you can't send this back. You're a direct distributor. We're, we're sending you the comic book. We're not taking the stuff back. That was Jim Shooter's idea. He said, you know, comic book stores, here's the deal. We're going to make a special arrangement with you where you can't return these because we're going to make a backlog issues. So the, the long boxes where eventually you could sell the thing for 25 cents or a dollar if you want. I don't care, but boom. And obviously it'd be weird to see a 75 cent comic book at the time for a dollar, but you get the point, right? Preserve these now. The whole idea is that back when I was a kid and I had all these comic books without the covers on them, I didn't know what the comic book was I only knew the characters inside. I couldn't retrace which comic book did what, where, whatever. All right? Um, I would read these comic books. Wow, that was a really long interlude, but whatever. I'm keeping it in. And I would read the comic books, and my vocabulary increased by so much. Simply because the people who were writing the comic books were brilliant. They understood the English language. There were better vocabulary words in, this, in these comic books. There was, there was proper sentence structure, grammatical syntax, right? Words make sense. Sentences made sense. The comic book made sense. There was a time in the 80s, and I don't think that there, it's still used today. I, it, if it is, it's an independent... Um, it's a mud show type idea to do it nowadays. But back in the back in the eighties and earlier, whenever you'd have prisoners who are uneducated, when 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 prisons weren't just punitive, when they were actually meant to reform people, when it didn't become a big money business, uh, they would actually try to educate. They would actually have official sanctioned programs to have you know prisoners earn their GED minimal to learn how to read because we realize the recidivism rate has a lot to do with education level. Oh, we have failed these people and public schools did not provide an education that allowed these people to read. So let's try and teach them to read. So maybe they won't end up back in jail again. Maybe they can actually contribute positively to a society, to our society, you know? So they would teach them how to read. And one of the things they would do is they would actually use comic books. Yeah, sure, there was always the insult of, oh, yeah, they need the pictures, blah, 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 blah. But it was because we were, the, the comic books at the time, they were smart enough. They were actually intelligent. 
you could read the comic book and go, wow, there's a, a very concise story. Every single comic book was a standalone and it was also good in a whole thing. So you could jump on any issue of a comic book. Amazing Spider-Man issue number 120. Jump on there and read it. No problems. You'll understand who Spider-Man is. You'll understand who the bad guy is he's fighting. You'd understand why he's fighting. And, and you could read just that comic book or start from there and read from that point on. And who cares about the previous issues? Or you could have been reading since issue one or issue number 15 of Amazing Fantasy, you know, saying back in the day. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's just one of those things, man. They were better. The, the, the vocabulary was better back then. That was before I was even born. But reading these old comic books, man, there's a reason why people like Donny Cates, right? You guys think I hate Donny Cates. I don't hate Donny Cates. I think that Donny Cates is potentially the future of comic books. He just needs to get out of this mindset where he thinks that he's talking to kids, right? I'm 10 years older than the man. You are not going to sell me a comic book by appealing to my kid's side, my man-child side. No. Stop. Kids are smart. Stan Lee himself said, DC sells to kids. We sell to adults in a kid-friendly way. That's the reason why we blow DC out of the goddamn water. Think like the way that the originators of comic books, superhero comic books, wrote back in the day. Think along those lines. Sell the comic books along those kinds of lines. Write the comic books along those kinds of lines. Your sales will dramatically improve because of word of mouth. I got it. My, my first full degree was in marketing. Well, actually it was in business with a, with a, a, a trait towards marketing, a specialty in marketing, but it's still in business. But the, the point is the way that you get sales to people the best way, besides a silly jingle, right, a cute saying, a cool commercial, right, is word of mouth. Because if you see something, you might try something, and it'll be whatever. But if you want something actually in your brain, if you want to get somebody, if you, if you say, that guy over there, I need John over there to be addicted to my coffee, to love my coffee. A jingle might work, whatever. But if you can get John's neighbor to go over and tell John, hey, John, what is this uh, this Folgers crap that you're drinking? Because, man, this Maxwell house, right? And there's an old marketing lesson about the the, the fight between Folgers and Maxwell house, how, how one out, you know, usurped the other one in, in, in sales and whatnot because the other one stopped marketing because they thought, I'm on top. You want John to get, have John's neighbor go over and say, yeah, dude, let me make you a cup of my Maxwell house. You know, saying like, holy crap, dude, this, this is the bomb right here. Forget about that Folger stuff that you're drinking, right? And all of a sudden he's like, hey, this is actually pretty good. Of course it's pretty good because one, it's freaking coffee <laughs> and it's just going to be a flavor. But the thing is, the poison was already put in your mind. If you want to call it poison or the, the whatever, right? The fairy dust. It was already put in your mind that, hey, my friend likes it. And this is my friend. Friends are sociable. Oh, my God. The, the, the moral of this story is if I or any other comic book reviewer, actually, I think I'm one of the only actual comic book reviewers reviewing an actual comic book instead of saying, oh, the story was cool. Here's what happened in the comic book. Oh, I liked it. And, you know, with all due respect, everybody's going to do the things they're going to do. But in my time, we used to know what the English language was and we knew what a review actually meant. <laughs> Say comic book recap if you want. I do reviews, <laughs> you know. This is me patting my own back. I'll try not to break my arm doing it. But the, a, English matters, for crying out loud, right? English matters. Words matter. Um, whatever it is, whatever comic book review channel that you go to, I don't care. I don't care. However, you if you don't like my reviews, that's fine. That's I'm okay with that. They're not for everybody, all right? I'm smart enough to know that. But at the end of the day... If I or someone else who you actually respect says this was a good comic book, you're more likely to go out and buy that comic book. I'm not saying you will. I'm saying you're more likely. The percentages suddenly go up, right? That you're going to go out and buy that comic book. If multiple of your friends or your sources say this is really good, 
and you can tell that there's genuine, like you trust this person. They're a genuine article. They're not just saying this because they think, oh, I'm going to say it's good because I'm going to get an interview by so-and-so. Um, I know what that feels like. But the point is, when the more people who you respect say, hey, this is good, you're more likely to go out and buy the thing. If you're reading a comic book that you like, and there's the little editor's note, editor's note, hey, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with what Dylan Brock is talking about here, boom, go over here instead. Comics used to be fantastic. They used to be amazing. They used to be something that companies would vie over to get, not because of the movie potential. Nobody ever thought that anybody was going to watch the movies because people weren't watching the movies, right? Go look up Reb Brown doing Captain America. They made two movies of that, right? And the first one was a rainbow costume until the very end with a glass frisbee, a plastic frisbee that would wrap. Look at the old Spider-Man movies, right? Look at, look, the Lou Ferrigno Hulk TV series was done right, for the most part, right? But at the end of the day, there's the only one that was actually truly successful. Everything else that they did failed miserably. All those old movies, they were terrible until the MCU came along. Realistically, until Blade came along and, and showed what we can do. And Spider-Man and the X-Men and all that, you know, good stuff afterwards also. And it wasn't until the MCU where we were like, yeah. Do not talk to me about a goddamn Snyder Cut. Don't. Don't. My point is, <laughs> <clears throat> comics used to be purchased for the sake of the comic book itself. I know that baffles the mind of some of the younger generation today, right? I'm talking the really younger gen, like the teenagers today. You might say, really? Because I only came in because of the movies. Comic books were a dirty little secret where you couldn't wear a Star Wars t-shirt or a Venom sweater to school. You couldn't do that. You'd get beaten up. I'm six foot five. I was ridiculously tall. I was in the martial arts since I was eight, right? I, I, I tried out for the football team. I was apparently too violent for the football team. They, you know, it's like, you're holding. You, you can't throw a, a guy to the ground like that. I thought football was breakneck. What the frick is this? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I played baseball and I and I and I uh, ran track. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I was athletic. I was in sports teams back in high school. I was a big guy. I dated, and I quietly played Dungeons and Dragons and read comic books on the side. Right? And there were people who had great comic book collections that I never talked to or even looked at in school, and they knew I would punch you in your mouth if you came over and tried to say, hey, what's going on? And you, hey, hey, what's going on? Hey, you, Bill. Hey, hey, it was cool having you over my house the other day. You know what I'm saying? My, my mom said if you come over next time, she'll make you some hot chocolate. I would punch that kid in the mouth before he got two words out of his mouth. Don't you ruin my reputation? Don't you tell people I like Dungeons and Dragons and comic books? Because that could literally get you ostracized, no matter who you were, you know? This is coming from a guy who was very popular in school. And this is like, no, I couldn't tell people I was into stuff like this. This was a dirty little secret. That's real talk. And yet it was a multi-million dollar asset in those days. It was so successful. <sighs> it could be that way again. It could. There's no reason on earth why it couldn't. When you look at these comic books today and you realize that the whole entire book is just exposition. By the way, in the previous issue, some people saying, oh, you, some people saying you, you, you spent too much talking about how, you know, the, the women's, you know, lib movement or whatever, blah, 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 blah. I'm not far off. And what I said, case in point, there was another double double cross in this. The the woman's lib thing, whatever. The, the the girl in this comic book turns out to be a bad guy. I don't think it was earned. Like that was the big, you know, surprise. You know, here's the turn, right? I don't think it was much of a surprise. I mean, I, I didn't expect it, but I wasn't like, you know, oh, 
you bitch. Because I wasn't invested in this character. This is the first time we've been hearing about this character, right? Also, Eddie Brock, to my understanding, was a bumbling reporter back in the day. Did they change that at some point? Because at some point there was a retcon. I remember the original Eddie Brock stories where he was just this idiot who he, he, he took a picture of Spider-Man and then inked it out. To show, oh, look, I got the black suit Spider-Man, you know, image. And then Peter Parker goes to Jay Jonah and, and Robbie Robinson and he goes and he's like, you know, oh, look, this is just a picture that I took that he just covered over. Look, it's the exact same movement, the exact same background, everything. He's a fraud and he got fired. And that's the reason why he always hated Peter Parker. He was a bumbling idiot of a reporter. Maybe they changed that at some point, said he was actually a really great ace reporter at some point. I, I don't remember that. I, I just don't. I think I've read too many comic books and some of them are blending in with each other. Whatever. It is what it is. The point is. <laughs> the point is, this is something I should have put in my address book as opposed to memorizing, I suppose. My point is, um, too many too many changes and things like that. And this was just casually thrown in. So is this retconned in this issue or is this just a reference to another retcon that had happened way back in the day. I think that's more likely the case because everything in this book for the most part was a reference except for like three or four pages, right? Look, if you want the whole twist that, you know, oh, she actually kidnapped Ed, uh, um, Dylan or, 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 or was complicit in his kidnapping, she facilitated the kidnapping, maybe, just maybe, maybe make it so that we're actually invested in the character first, right? Make everybody sat there and said, when we, when we were reading this book, it's like, okay, obviously this is going to be the chick who is going to wind up uh, being the new surrogate mother for Dylan. Cool. Let's read that. Show me that. But we never got there. It's the sign of a good writer when you can anticipate what the reader is going to like. How can you do that? Well, I mean, you're the one doing the story, right? Look, I'm, I'm not sitting here trying to bash Ram V. I'm simply saying that I don't think that he was ready for something this high profile. And let's be realistic. He's realistically just the Jared Leto uh, in the Jokerverse, as far as the Venom comic books are concerned, right? We just got off of this run, and, and it was a very divisive run. And, and Donnie, who's no longer on Twitter, apparently, he's only on Instagram at this point, I... I didn't think he was actually looking at reviews. I, I Honestly, I didn't think that Donnie was the type to look at reviews because he said that he doesn't look at reviews. He even told me when, when I was interviewing him, he's like, oh, yeah, man. One of my buddies told me, yo, you got to check out this guy, you know what I'm saying, um, who, who, who's reviewing your books, man. He actually gets it. Yeah, in the beginning, I, I did get it. There was a lot to get. It was, it was fantastic work before it all went to his head. Um, but... Donnie was writing some really amazing stuff, some revolutionary stuff with Venom in the beginning. Anyway, the point is, he indicated that he wasn't looking at the reviews, that his buddy told him about that. Well, did his buddy tell him about all these reviews nowadays? I, I don't understand. I don't understand. So now I'm starting to think, oh, he just said that because he didn't want to say you got to be an honest person. I tell you about stories from my life. I, I tell you things that are kind of damning about my life, you know what I'm saying? Just because, like, I'm I'm real, and you, ju you judge that on your own, but you got to be honest with people, because people can see through your lies, and when you've lied, when you bullshitted your way through a bunch of stuff, it's really hard to regain people's trust. You can, and you should. You should definitely direct all of your attentions to regaining people's trust again, because otherwise you're just ostracized from society, and that's when you start getting depressed, and you can have suicidal thoughts, being ostracized, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's self-isolation or otherwise, that's why the pandemic is so messed up, right? But when you've ostracized yourself and people don't trust you anymore, you need to regain their trust. And sometimes that's going to involve actually saying some things, actually saying some things that are true and that will open you up to ridicule because you've already opened yourself up to ridicule by being caught in your lies, you know? Case in point. His thing was stuttering. Oh, yeah, if I tell somebody, you know, if, if somebody questions me about my stuttering, I explain it's just a, a condition, blah, 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 whatever. But if that's not good enough for them, my father said to punch them right in the mouth. Donnie, there are times to punch people in the mouth. Coming from a, an old fighter back in Jersey, there are absolutely times to punch people in the mouth. 
but kids just doing some teasing. How about either your father was a freaking idiot who was hoping that you were going to be strong when he was weak. If, if that's not the case, how about let's look at it. And this is stuff that he's gone through in, in Twitter. How about instead look at it this way? Maybe you should have simply left with it. That's what I teach my son. I'm like, dude, you can't be this guy who just goes around punching people in the mouth because they make fun of you. You need to laugh with it. So this way, they're laughing with you. Now, there's a fine line between laughing with you and laughing at you. Because we're men. We're men. And I don't know how women do it because I'm not a woman. But I can tell you about men. Men make fun of each other. We do that because we're trying to see, do you have a soft skin? Because if you do, I don't need to be hanging out with you because you're not the type of person who's going to lay on the, the, um, uh, the, the barbed wire for me if I need it. You're not going to be the guy who jumps on the landmine. You're not going to be the guy who takes the bullet. You're going to be the guy who runs if things go down, right? And that's, and, and, and that's just coming from me. That, that works in the nerdy sec, uh, uh, section also. If things get tough, you're going to bail out. If the, if the homework gets too hard and we're doing a study session together, like I don't give a funk what the hell it is. If we're both doing something together and things get too hard, right? When I was playing baseball when I was a kid, if we're down by four points, I'm looking at this as, dude, all we need to do is get the bases loaded and put our best batter up, and we're done. We're, we're tied, and, and then it's anybody's game. At that point, one good swing gets us that. You know what I'm saying? You could bunt it three times, and then boom, you know, shoot for the goddamn fences Babe Ruth style, baby. You know, I'm, I'm Don Maddenly up in here when he was good. It doesn't matter. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. What does that saying mean? What does that idiom in the English language mean, right? When the going gets tough, the cowards turn tail and run, but the tough get going. It's like, hey, it's getting rough. Tighten up your belt, crack your neck, fucking muscle forward. Because I'm not going to get ran over. I'm not going to get bowled over by life. It's time to shuffle on. It's time to move on. Right? We got to plow through this or find some way to get through this. And sometimes that means a little bit of backbreaking work. But at the end, at the end, after we've, we've soaked in freaking, you know, Calgon, take me away, whatever, whatever you got to do to make you, you know, some icy hot. After it's over, you're going to look back and you say, the job well done. I just kicked ass out there. You don't need somebody else to pat you on the back. Pat yourself on the back. I just did it earlier. You know? But what about the coward? What about the wimp? What about the loser who couldn't hack it? Sometimes it's not about punch the guy in the face. Hey, if they, if, if they refuse to laugh with you and they start laughing at you, beat the living crap out of them. You will take your respect or you will not get it because nobody's going to hand it to you. This is nobody's favor. You're nobody's charity case. At least you shouldn't want to be. There used to be a time when we were tough and we took what we wanted, not by taking away from others. Those people were criminally prosecuted. No, we got up and we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. If you don't have bootstraps, well, then that's your first order of business. The point is, you simply said, it's time to go. And by the way, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. All that means is the strap on the back of your shoe, you'd stick your finger in there and pull your freaking shoe on over your heel. You didn't need a freaking, I don't want to bend down. You know, the little shoehorn, right? Old people did that. People who couldn't, you know, pull themselves up by the bootstraps would do that. The point is, that I, I've gone off on such a tangent here, and whatever it is, what it is. If you don't like my reviews, like I said, there's so much wrong in this comic book. Every single thing in here is just, it's extrapolated from an explanation of some sort. There's, he bonded with the, the symbiote, but now the, the symbiote's calling him a coward and stuff like that. And, and oh, it just reminds me of my dad. And this chick turns on him. <laughs> what else happens in this book? She's going around and she's tasing people and, you know, being so tough and okay, you know, you, you, you handled yourself and, and there's a, there's the big turn and, oh, we captured the kid and. All of this stuff is happening in the book. And all I'm doing is turning the pages. 
I'm not gripping the book. Well, I can't because I'm reading it digitally. But, you know, say this isn't gripping. And that's where that comes from. When you're reading a book and you're just like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Right? It's like, you know, oh, I got to be careful. I'm, I'm tearing the book. Who cares? Whatever. This is amazing. This is gripping, you know, writing. Wow. None of this is. None of this is earned. I don't care about this This conspiracy theory chick because if if she had a cameo in the previous issue and this is her first full appearance and in her first full appearance she's earned zero trust from us zero oh i think your dad was just bilking me for information and and being a source and things like that but he was a tough guy who was going in war zones and he was doing all these amazing things before and whatnot that doesn't make me say oh my god this is wonderful no he introduced this woman in the previous issue as a motherly figure. If you don't realize that your audience was going to to recognize her as a motherly figure, well then, you funked up because you were the one writing it. And people are going to interpret things different ways, but there's some things you're not going to interpret differently. Nobody's going to look at this and say, isn't Dylan Brock an Indian guy? Isn't he from like Kerala or something? I... Malayalam, maybe? I, I don't know. So I could, um, like, I, I don't understand. What the hell? Right? No. He's a white guy. He's a freaking blonde-haired, white-skinned, white, -haired, white, -skinned, white cauc caucasoid. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on. Right? There's some things that are not open for interpretation. When you make a character a motherly, a potentially surrogate motherly uh, character, and then you're going to have her betray him, it's going to be gripping, when she actually, not just saves him from whatever, you know, to, eh, I'm going to kind of end your trust. No, when, when there's actual conversation, where some actual repertoire, right? When there's some, some, some communication, some talking where, you know, they're really reliving things and don't worry, I got you, kid. Oh, you're going through a rough time. Hey, I got you. Oh my God. They're, they're coming up. I, I saved your life again. Oh, let me get you out of here. Look. You see them right there? Look, this is some, when she starts teaching him things, this is what you look for. You know what I'm saying? Your father was so effective because he had a reporter's eye. This is how you get that reporter's eye. Look, boom, 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 boom. And then when all of a sudden she betrays him, then it's like, oh, you bitch. And you're really involved. You're really deep. You sunk your teeth deep into this. And just like, up, oh, stakes halfway down. Might as well finish it. You know what I'm saying? And then something happens where all of a sudden, like, oh, I do feel bad because blah, blah, blah. How do I, you're not going to regain my trust because you never had my trust in the first place. You are a treacher, treacherous wretch. That's what this character is. How is this something that's going to get me excited about reading the next issue? The next issue is just going to be a bunch of stuff. It's just going to be flipping through pages because some things are going to happen. This whole thing is plot driven. How many times have you heard me say these things before? This story is plot driven. There is zero substance for characters in here. Donny Cates left back in the day. You, you put the toys back on the shelf the way you love. Hey, you want to come over and play with my toys? Get an invite first. Otherwise, I'm going to shoot you because you don't break into my house. But if I invite you in my home, hey, come on in. You can play with my toys. But you see the way they are? I want them back on the shelf exactly the way that they were and dust it off before you put it back up there. And then I'll let you play with them again. That's the way it used to always be with comic books back in the day. If you're going to take Iron Man and turn him into this, that, and the other thing and all these different things, cool. But you put him back the way you found him at the end. And Iron Man is probably the worst example of that. But Captain America, Spider-Man, Venom, right? Prince Namor, the Fantastic Four, all of them. Look, the, all, remember back right after Jim Shooter left, they changed the thing into some spiky, rocky thing. They turned the Hulk into uh, gray, right? And, and, and he was weaker and whatnot, right? Um, he, he was Joe Fix-It, right? They did all these different characters. They started changing all these different things about them. Cool. But by the time that the writer was finished with all those things, what happened? They went back on the shelves. Hulk was green. There were no more... The thing didn't look like a pineapple anymore, right? And I liked those stories. My favorite version of the Hulk was Peter David's Joe Fix-It. My absolute favorite version. But I don't want somebody else jumping on this again. Dude, the way that Al Ewing ended his Immortal Hulk series, there's a couple new characters in his life. 
that could have come or gone, and who cares? Who would have cared? Oh, we could miss them, but Hulk could have gone back to just being Hulk. He could have been any version of the Hulk that the next writer wanted him to be, right? And Donny Cates made him into a goddamn spaceship! <laughs> well, my point is, my point is, this is what happened. Nowadays, Donnie's just like, oh, yeah! Hey, Eddie Brock's a god. He's the king in black. I made the king in black. Look at this stuff. That's cute. So now Ram has the incredible misfortune of saying, "Fuck, what do I do with this?" Well, I could kill him, and I'll make the story about Dylan instead. It's not about the symbiote because the, symb the the main symbiote, Venom, he gets left behind. I'm going to take Sleeper with me on this issue. And we haven't seen Sleeper being some incredible special thing. <laughs> we haven't looked at Sleeper and said, oh, my God, look at all the wonderful things. No, that was, what was that, Bagley? Like, that was a while ago that Sleeper actually meant something. Sleeper hasn't been turned into something fantastic under Donny Cates. That was, like, what, 40 issues or whatever the hell that was? He hasn't been made into anything special under Cates. And he hasn't been made into anything special under e e Ewing for the first issue or, or Ram for these three issues. So when Sleeper gets chumped, it's like, eh, it's because he's a chump. He's a punk-ass bitch. You know what I'm saying? Who cares about Sleeper? No. Like, in this issue, it's like, dude, they just established that um, Venom, that Clintar, he's this guy who just, you know, boom, 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 stomping through things. And then they set it up and they showed. He gets angry and he just... Ah, I'm strong. Ah! Instead of, oh, you remind me of my daddy. Instead, he could have said, and I love you for that. You, If I needed to stomp through there and just start kicking ass, that's exactly what I would do. And maybe, maybe you could wait outside. And if, you, and if I'm not out in 20 minutes, then you come in and you do that. But for right now, for right now, I need to go in there stealth mode. And Sleeper's the way to do that. I'm sorry. If I needed a blunt instrument, oh, it would be you, and I would blunt my way right through it. But right now, I need stealth. Boom! How much better would that have been? Instead of just, I'm going to take Sleeper because you remind me too much of my daddy. Do we, do we have to make our protagonist into a bitch? Who are we supposed to root for in this? Sleeper does nothing. Dylan is just whiny and crying and trusts, obviously, the wrong people, right? Venom itself is like, I can't control myself. Eddie is dead. Don't worry. He'll come back like Jesus. I'm sure this is going to be a messianic kind of thing. I have zero doubt in my mind that this is going to be something along those lines. <laughs> the, the second coming of Eddie. Oh, oh, oh. Move the rock. And show that you have come back. Eat, take of my flesh, take of my blood. Like what the frick? <laughs> Stop this. Um, I don't know who to root for in this. I don't know where the hero is in this book. I don't know. I, I don't know anything about the characters anymore. I don't know what they're trying to tell us. This is all about plot. And this is a book that is rife with exposition. This is not how you sell a good comic book. Oh, the, the thing I said before about he's the Jared Leto. Think about it. Jack Nicholson was the Joker, right? Before that, it was Cesar Romaro. He was the Joker, right? And even with his, must, his white painted mustache, Cesar Romaro was the Joker, right? And that was a Joker that could have worked with a Dark Knight Batman instead of an Adam West campy Batman, right? The 66 Batman. This is, this is a Joker that could work in any time, any place. And he was iconic and he was perfect. And then Jack Nicholson came along and gave us this dark one that was just like, yeah, you are, you are terrifying. Right? I, I, I know that at some point you are going to kill me. And then what do we get? Even though nobody expected to be good. We got the what, what many people, you know, themselves consider the iconic, and I'm trying to remember his name, and I can't remember his name right now. But we got the um, the, the the other guy who played. Why can't I remember his name? He's a pretty good actor. I'm surprised he even took such a major role. But comic book movies at the time weren't considered a major things, so maybe he didn't think that this was going to be such a big thing. It was big to us, the comic book viewers. But anyway, my point is, 
Um, he goes and he plays the Joker in the, the Christian Bale movies. You know what I'm saying? Specifically the, the, the second one, uh, Dark Knight. And it was amazing because you didn't know what you were going to get. You had no idea. He'd be like, let me show you a magic trick. And he kept on doing that lizard-like, you know, thing where it's like you could see his primal instincts coming through, you know, saying in his, in his dinosaur-like mind, you know, and everything's about me, but how I'm going to get it is one of those weird things. I'm going to put myself in danger. Go ahead. Put the gun to my head. Now, let me tell you something. You know, and it's like, oh my God, like really good. It was a fantastic movie. It was a fantastic movie. And he played a really incredible role in that movie. So it's one of those things, anybody who comes along and doesn't play the best version of the Joker or, or some iconic version of the Joker afterwards, it's like fail and we're all going to say bad things. And Jared Leto, you know, ah, 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 ah. Aside from the people who are Snyder aficionados, because they know that Snyder handpicked this guy and that Ayers didn't. Um, aside from them, I don't think anybody's going to look at this and be like, dude, this guy played just, he played the most terrifying Joker. Oh, my God. Especially when you look at the end of the Snyder cut, the the uh, of the Justice League, where it's just five minutes of him talking. And at the end, it's like, Batman's just like, okay, whatever, let's go. Wow, completely used it. Jared Leto has absolutely failed as the Joker. And some of the backstory is actually good if you looked into what the Iris cut would have looked like, why there was the tattoo of the hand, or, or the, the laughing mouth with teeth on there. Meanwhile, he's got the metal grill in his mouth. If you looked into the backstory of why that was and so many other aspects of, you know, what the story was actually supposed to be before they just, they butchered it on the chopping uh, cut floor, plus put the stupid freaking goofy angelic battle in there that, that that and that was Snyder. That was Snyder's contribution to the movie. Like really? You couldn't have just kept the movie the way it was. You had to have Snyder come in with the slow motion. <gasps> ah, ooh, hey, ah. Don't talk to me about the Snyder cut. <laughs> but obviously Jared Leto was not gonna be, you know, saying the big time freaking Joker <laughs> at any moment. He was not. And then the way they butchered it afterwards, it actually made him look like he was completely inept. He is not completely inept, but he's not the iconic guy. Just imagine being the guy who can't quite make the cut after these three iconic Jokers prior to this. It's just one of those things, man. It's just one of those things. And right now, Ram V gets to be the Jared Leto of this because this just, it isn't cutting it. And it's actually bad. It's like, this is... To me, this is just not good. If you liked it, you liked it. That's fine. I'm Again, I'm not trying to insult you or your tastes. I'm saying in comic books, in literature, in works of fiction, this just doesn't cut the mustard. It simply doesn't. Um, this could have been so... Uh, on every single turn of the page, I'm just like... You missed an opportunity. You missed really good stuff because I've read good comic books. I, I've, I've, I've seen good comic books. I've, I've published good comic books. You know, it's just, it is what it is. Anyways, guys, I'm done. <laughs> this has gone long enough. Like, you could have read this comic book multiple times by the time that you're finished with this. So it is what it is. Guys, like the video. If you stayed this long and you don't like the video, now I'm judging you. And watch an ad so that maybe I can make a couple bucks to buy the next, you know, few comic books and judge them. And maybe I can, if, if, if enough people watch ads, hey, who knows? I might actually be able to buy a comic book that I enjoy. <laughs> you never know. It's, it's a numbers game at this point. I'll talk to you guys later. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.